Welcome. I am Ingrid Handy and President Elect of the Paleoceanography and Paleoclimate section. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 22nd Annual Emiliani Lecture. I would like to start by thanking those of you who have nominated one of your colleagues for this named lecture, as well as those who have served on your on the committee to select this year's speaker. This year, I would like to uh, congratulate Elizabeth Sykes on being our 22nd Emiliani Lecturer. It is usual at this point to give some background to the person who this lecture series was named after. Cesare Emiliani is considered the father of paleoceanography. He was born in Italy in 1922 and he received his first PhD in 1945 in micropaleontology. He moved to the University of Chicago where he worked with Harold Urey and he completed his second PhD in 1955, this time in geology. He then moved to Miami's Institute of Marine Science, which later became the Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Emiliani is considered the father of paleoceanography because at his time at Chicago, he and Yuri developed the techniques to measure isotopic composition of foraminifera that um, then became our tape recorder of ocean and climatic changes. He realized that he could record temperature and salinity of the ocean at the time of the foraminiferal, uh, foraminiferous growth. And he showed for the first time that ice ages are a cyclic phenomenon. And this gave strong support to the Milankovitch hypothesis and revolutionized ideas about the history of the planet, oceans, and climate. His paper from 1955 still receives an average of about 20 citations per year, um, more than 50 years after its publication. There were two technical problems that dogged Emiliani. One is that he underestimated the amount of oxygen isotopes sequestered in continental ice. And this led other, others to develop the field to solve these issues. For example, it led Nick Shackleton to develop the micromass on mass spectrometers to analyze benthic foraminifera, which grew at what we assumed at the time to be a near constant temperature. He also underestimated his sedimentation rate by about 20%, and it took dating from other types of geologic reservoirs to demonstrate this. Usually also at this point, speakers talk about how they met Cesar Emiliani and their interactions. So I did meet him, in 1972, I was six months old, and there was a intense two day discussion where he wanted to interpret my father's speleothem records the same way he interpreted his foraminiferal records. So that is my connection. Elizabeth Sykes, this year's Emiliani lecturer, began her career working in um, organic compound techniques. She published a series of groundbreaking papers for um, generating sea surface temperature reconstructions using alkanones. And these papers today are highly cited. And she used this work and has continued to use this work in the Southern Hemisphere to provide critical information about movements of ocean fronts, movements of the winds, southerly, the southern westerly winds, and the Pacific Ocean, the Southern Ocean. I first encountered Liz when she was doing her work off New Zealand, innovative work using volcanic ash layers to provide independent non-radiocarbon dates to assess surface ocean and deep ocean reservoir ages. Her work here contributed to our understanding of how the deep ocean sequestered the missing CO2 during glacial intervals. These are the cold intervals of the Milankovitch cycles that Emiliani helped um, support. Much of her work in the southern has focused on the southern hemisphere and the southern ocean. She's used depth transects to reconstruct vertical structures of the past ocean and demonstrate its role in carbon sequestration to show how the southern hemisphere winds led thermohaline circulation changes to drive CO2 out of intermediate water depths.
Throughout her career, Liz has generously invested her time to provide intellectual leadership and to serve the community. She is currently a professor at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers University. She has been an associate editor of Paleoceanography and Paleoclimatology for nine years, a steering member of the PAGES OC3 Working Group and the Clivar Southern Ocean Regional Panel. Liz embodies the scientific spirit of Cesar Emiliani in that much of her efforts have focused on development and testing of paleoceanographic methods. And I welcome Liz Sykes as this year's Emiliani lecturer. Good morning. Uh, my name is Liz Sykes, and I'm very pleased to be here giving you the Emiliani lecture for 2020. Um, I have been working in the Southern Ocean for most of my professional life. Um, why? I like to say that's because that is where the Southern Ocean, the Southern Ocean is where the ocean exhales. We've known, um, we know that the deep ocean holds 50 times more CO2 than the atmosphere today. And in glacial times, we know that the ocean held even more CO2 than today. Uh, and um, what I'm showing here is the one of the most important paleoclimatic records that from the last 50 years. This is the record of CO2 taken from gas, atmospheric gas in ice cores. And what it shows us is that in the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago here, that the CO2 in the atmosphere was one third less than today. And over the course of uh, less than 10,000 years, the atmosphere CO2 content increased by a third. The rapidity of that change is one of the most important diagnostics for us to understand that it had to come out of the deep ocean. That's the only other uh, reservoir of CO2 on the planet that could deliver that much CO2 to the atmosphere in that much time. So um, although I think it's very well understood that probably the uh, basic forcing for climate change is insulation, the amount of solar energy coming into the planet, and that CO2 is an amplifier. So to understand the, the uh, Earth's climate changes, we need to look at both. So um, one, oops. Um, another thing that's important about this record is not just, so the CO2 is an amplifier on the solar radiation. And one of the important pieces in that is, is looking at the details of this record. So not only was this CO2 change very rapid, but it came in steps. And so um, with the first rise being Hein during Heinrich Stadia one, a pause during the Antarctic cold reversal and another rise in the Younger Dryas. And so one of the questions is, is not what the basic mechanisms of how the planet came out of the last ice age, but what are the details of it? What are the um, drivers of that change? And so, um, so one of which I think most would agree, as I said, that the, the, that the models have told us that the main driver is the solar radiation coming in at 65 north um, in June, but CO2 is an important amplifier. And so one of the things we've also known for a long time is there's a southern uh, northern dichotomy. So what's the driver? There's been a, there's another northern northern, <laughs> northern southern dichotomy in the climate change. So there was this I wanted to point you to this uh, seminal paper by Shakun et al. in uh, 2012 where they broke that down for us. So this is a rather uh, lower resolution CO2 record that was available at the time from um, from Antarctica. And what they've put on this is what they did was they were able to break down the uh, temperature records from the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere and try and look at the leads and the lags in the system because it's the leads and the lags that tell us what are the key tick points, what are the key tipping points getting us from one uh, uh, climate regime to another. And so what you can see from this record very clearly, here's the last glacial maximum and the southern hemisphere in red warmed, started to warm up before the CO2 rose. And in contrast, as the CO2 started to rise, the Northern Hemisphere was cooling. And this is a period that's known in the Northern, northern Hemisphere terrestrial world as the Older Dryas. Um, but for those of us who are oceanographers, it's better known as Heinrich Wen. That was a time of slowdown of uh, meridional overturning circulation or the thermal haline circulation of the ocean. Um, and a cooling in the Northern Hemisphere. And so as the Southern Hemisphere continued to warm, 
um, the CO2 rapidly came out of the uh, ocean or rapidly rose. Um, and then the next part thing was there's a pause or a cooling in the Southern Hemisphere known as the Antarctic Cold Reversal. That was a time of warming in the Northern Hemisphere here named the Bowling Alarod by the Northern Hemisphere workers. And then following that, there was another rapid rise in CO2 as the Southern Hemisphere warmed, but there was a cooling in the Northern Hemisphere called the Younger Dryas. So remember those time frames. There's gonna be a quiz later in the talk um, to make sure you've remembered them. Um, and they're pretty important to the story. And then the, um, they caught up and we have a fairly similar climate in both hemispheres today. So one of the reasons that there is not a really well-defined Antarctic cold reversal here, which is very clear in the ice core records, uh, temperature records and so on, is because there's a dearth of temperature, terrestrial and sea surface temperature records in the Southern hemisphere. So that was one of the reasons I first started going to the Southern Ocean was to try and look at these temperature records and just get a good look at what, um, uh, what was the temperature in the Southern Ocean and how was that uh, driving uh, or, or relating to these climate changes? So I just wanna start off by showing you a very recent paper uh, we published last year, where we added a new core from the uh, subtropical uh, region in New Zealand to two previously published records from um, also from the region. And the other thing I need to remember to tell you is that um, one of the reasons I'm working in this region and not just in the Southern Ocean is the subtropical front runs right along here in New Zealand and the subtropical front is the boundary to the northern, it's the northern boundary of the Southern Ocean. So anything north of that is subtropical waters, anything south of that is subpolar. And that helps us understand, in looking at these contrasts, we can look at temperature gradings across the hemisphere and things like that. So I wanna show you a sea surface temperature record based on alkanones. Um, these are long chain compounds that um, record temperature in the number of double bonds they have. And so we took the, our record and added it to the previous ones. And the take home, there's only two take homes I want you to have from this picture. Uh, it's got a lot of noise. On. It's very high resolution. We can really see the temperature in very fine detail. It's very well, our stratigraphy is really well tied because of the ash layers in New Zealand. Um, and so if you look at this uh, latitudinal difference between these cores back in the LGM, it, it's about the same as it is today. So there isn't much of a change in this latitudinal gradient. So we don't see much change, dramatic changes between these two ocean masses. The other important thing is here is you can squint at it. Whoops, you can squint at it, but um, the temperature started to change. You can look at this and decide, but it started to change about 20,000 years ago. No matter how you shake it, the, all of these cores show early warming relative to Heinrich one, remember, gonna give you a test, which is normally seen as the initiation of deglaciation. And that started about uh, light, right out about 18,000 years ago. So we're seeing the mid latitudes of the Southern hemisphere warming before um, the deep ocean and before we see ice melting or anything like that. But to get to this point, we had to start with getting a good calibrated quantitative sea surface temperature. So when I started in the so southern, working in the Southern Ocean uh, this many years ago, um, Stu Wakeham and Fred Prawl had just published a calibration of this UK 37 or alkanones um, in, um, and it was one of the first quantitative markers we had. And um, and so I want, but I wanted to work in the Southern Ocean. Oh, geez, I keep touching this. So um, I wanted to work in the Southern Ocean. And in reality, the, the thing there is that um, this calibration only went down to about 12 degrees. And that's kind of where the Southern Ocean started. So John Volkman and I set out to try and quantify this compound for use in cold polar waters. And uh, so this is the take home paper, the take home figure from that paper. We saw that this was a nice continuum with the warm waters, which was great, um, but there was a flattening of the curve at cold temperatures. And that's because of a increasing insensitivity to uh, as you get close to the limits of the technique. And we predicted that there would be a flattening of the curve at the warmer temperatures, but mostly the, the this paper 
is a really good um, calibration for using in cold waters, but we did predict that there would be some flattening at the uh, higher end. And what was nice is this is a synthesis paper from um, Tim Herbert in 2001, and a lot more work by Maureen Conti almost a decade, more than a decade later, shows that this holds that we have this great calibration, it hasn't really changed much, and we do see somewhat of a flattening at the surface. So we have a good quantitative marker from these compounds, from these phytoplankton. And that is um, um, something we can work with. Now, I haven't mentioned to this point the name of the phytoplankton that makes these compounds. Meet Emiliania huxleyi. It is a coccolithophore, um, and it make and very very few species of coccolithophores make alkanones that we can use these compounds. And in fact, um, um, until 1995, we thought it was only Emiliania huxleyi. But what the reason I'm so glad to be giving this talk um, is because yes, Emiliania huxleyi is named after Cesare Emiliani, um, and why is it named after Cesare Emiliani is for someone who worked his entire life on forams, why is a phytoplankton named after Cesare? Um, it used to be called Coccolithus huxleyi, but um, I, and I had the great opportunity to meet um, Cesare Emiliani at many meetings in the late 80s and early 90s when he was still quite active. And um, I was also uh, able to speak, I was in the session, the, the Emiliani, um, session in at Spring AGU in 1994. He was also there uh, attending. And so I had the chance to ask him if he would tell us why this coccolithophore was named for him. And Cesare was known to be have, uh, have a great sense of humor, and he really did. And he complied, and he told this story at the dinner at, after, um, after the session. And it's been a few years, and so um, I, uh, some of the details may have been a little bit warped in the telling, but I have the basics right, I'm sure. But so this is just a picture. I also want to just stop and say this is a picture of the cohort from who were in their 30s during that meeting, because he, we had a, 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 a photo session, everyone got a photo session with Cesare, and these are just the young folks who were there um, at the meeting. And so, so what did he tell us about that? He had, um, he was, um, at the time that um, in the 60s, he was the chair of the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Miami University. And he, um, he lured Bill Hayes, William Hayes, to the university as a faculty member by telling him he would buy him an SEM, a scanning electron microscope. And so Bill gets there and he starts looking at, the, at uh, his coccolis. He was a coccolis worker, obviously. But before SEM, I need to say, before SEM, we were using, they were using light microscopes. And this is what the, uh, what you could see. It was pretty grainy. It was pretty difficult. You know, they were just a little bit too small to work, but a better look meant they could tell it was a different genus. And as Cesare said, Bill came to him really, really excited. It's not just different. It's a different genus. And that you have to, when you want to describe a new genus or a new species, it has to be done in Latin. And so Bill said, um, well, he knew that, well, we all know that Cesare was Italian, but being Italian, he was also fluent in Latin. So he told Cesare if he would write the description in Latin for him, he would name the bug after him. And that's how it happened. And so Coccolithus huxleyi became Emiliania huxleyi. And again, I think it's immensely ironic that um, Cesare, who is known for his work in forams, has a phytoplankton named after him. But I think it's also really wonderful because he is the father of paleooceanography. And this is a ubiquitous uh, phytoplankton, and it's one of the most prolific calcifiers in the world today. And so it's nice to know that he's going to be remembered not just for the work he did, but for the organism that's named after him. So I have continued to work with um, um, with uh, phytoplankton, with sorry, with these alkanones over the um, over the last few decades, and um, uh, over the last few decades. But um, one of the things I like working about it is because it is a 
phytoplankton. It's stuck in the surface. It has to be in the photic zone. But we also rely, we still rely on 4AMs and their isotopes. And we now have new techniques where uh, newer techniques, so uh, obviously magnesium calcium, for which we can uh, look at the, um, uh, the uh, in the 4AMs and get sea surface temperature as well. The important thing for me is that they are different organisms and they have different controls. So you can look at one alkanones or or four amps, and you can say, well, they don't agree. Well, of course they don't agree. They're different organisms. They have different controls. And so one of the things I've been doing throughout my career is also looking at both of these for what they are. And so four amps being zooplankton are um, tied to the food that they eat. And so they tend to be spring, spring bloom indicators because they follow the diatoms and that spring bloom and uh, feed on them. Whereas Emiliani Huxleyi is a phytoplankton, and it is it is uh, uh, not it, uh, it it doesn't need as much nutrients as diatoms, so they tend to bloom just after the main bloom. So if you think about it that way, now we have a way to look at seasonality and compare and contrast, and so we can think about how did the seasons change? Were they more similar with summer and winter, summer and spring the same, or was summer and spring more different in the past? And so that brings me back to the whole story of this 2019 paper, where not only did we look at alkanones, we also looked at the magnesium, calcium, and 4 amps. And so I don't want you to try and parse this record here. What I want to point out are two things, is that the warming across the seasons were, are, was variable. So if you look at the, the two different plots, they look very different. Um, so we're seeing a change in seasonality across these, this major climate change. But one thing that stayed the same is the, the both seasons warmed up earlier than we see a change in the meridional overturning circulation. So, um, so we also looked at this south of Tasmania because the front near, New Zealand is fairly well fixed by the landmass there, but south of Tasmania, it can move a little bit more. And so we can see whether the Southern Ocean expanded or contracted with the changes in winds and changes in climate in the past. So to make a very long story short, um, today the, the front sits south and it moves north. It moved north in the glaciation. So we had a larger, colder Southern Ocean back then. Whoops. Um, and then as the deglaciation occurred, it moved back south. And so sort of a take home message from this was the movement of the front mimics seasonality today. It does this movement a little bit today. The fronts move north and south with annual climate change, but without going into the details, the seasonality was different just like we saw in New Zealand. So we're seeing not only a cooling with these two with different temperature markers, we're seeing a change in how the seasons uh, um, pulsed. So that brings me back to, so, but it became clear if we want to know um, how those, so if we want to know, we, we, we're looking at how the Southern Ocean expanded, but to understand how the Southern Ocean exhales, we have to think about the deep water in the Southern Ocean. And that's because um, the reason there's CO2 there to exhale is because of thermohaline circulation, or it's also called a mid, or Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And I love that, or AMOC. I love that because um, with AMOC, you're always thinking about the Atlantic leading. And I don't, I'm not so sure the Atlantic was leading all the way through. So to understand that, um, we're going to look deeper at the skin. And so instead of doing latitudinal um, transects, I started working with depth transects of core. But let's look at the theory first. So how does the ocean sequester CO2? I started off by saying this deep ocean holds 50 times the amount of CO2 as the atmosphere. And you can see here that the um, this is the concept of the ocean conveyor belt um, introduced to us by the uh, by Wally Broker, the great Wally Broker. And it's a very good model to start with for understanding this uh, process. So warm salty water coming, oh gosh, coming north in the Atlantic um, uh, is quick chilled by Arctic uh, winds and increases in density and sinks and then travels around the Southern Ocean 
travels down the Atlantic Ocean and feeds the entire planet with cold, salty water. While it travels along that path, the biological pump puts CO2 into it through, uh, and I'll get to that in a second, but what's really important about this figure in terms of thinking about the Southern Ocean is that it just shows the, the deep ocean just sliding along in the Southern Ocean, but this is where it interacts. So to understand that, we have to slice open the Southern Ocean and have a good look at the layers because it's a lot more complicated than this makes out. So if we look at this, what we've got is, um, so as I said, the North Atlantic deep water travels down the Atlantic Ocean and rises up in the Southern Ocean. So and the biological pump is basically phytoplankton taking up CO2 in the surface ocean, turning it into biomass, sinking into the deep ocean, being uh, eaten and respired back as CO2. So heterotrophy puts that CO2 back into the ocean and CO2 builds up in the deep ocean. And because it's under pressure, it can't get back out into the atmosphere. Another thing I just wanna say in terms of um, uh, our, our uh, and we can trace this, that we can trace this biopump with the C13 in the DIC, because not only does do phytoplankton take up CO2 in the surface ocean, they discriminate, discriminate against C13. So the surface ocean is in, enriched in C13 and respired CO2 is depleted in C13. And so we can trace that signal of CO2 back through the past, in the past with the C13. So we have this uh, CO2 rich water that's coming up in the Southern Ocean and um, it outcrops because of the density layers there. And if it outcrops um, and and it if it out and it degasses, the CO2 can come out. And so if it outcrops to the north where there's a lot of wind and a lot of uh, wind stress, the CO2 is released. And in this zone of the Southern Ocean is where we have lots of rain, and they call it, you can either think of it as buoyancy gain or density loss, but this deep salty deep water becomes less dense and it moves north because of the wind stress and it sinks again to form either Antarctic intermediate water or subantarctic mode water. One sits on top of the other. And so this water is a, has, um, has thoroughly, not thoroughly, but um, quite thoroughly degassed and, um, and has a signal that is more or less in equilibrium with the atmosphere. Not 100%, but let's go with that for now. And the water that outcrops to the south is, um, is, has less time at the surface, doesn't tend to equilibrate, and sinks again as Antarctic bottom water through brine rejection. Um, it gets more dense, and it forms Antarctic bottom water. And so we have our North Atlantic deep water entering the ocean, primarily forming Antarctic bottom water, and um, our shallower layers forming these, Antar these other, uh, Antarctic intermediate and um, uh, subantarctic mode water. So this atmospheric CO2 today reflects a balance between the biological and the physical ventilation. So it's not hard to make the connection that changes in either ocean circulation or winds can alter the CO2 content in the deep ocean. And we're pretty sure, oh, well, we know that happened in the past. Um, but to understand that a little better, how all these layers of the Southern Ocean and how we can change um, the partitioning between the atmosphere and the ocean, we need to stop thinking about the ocean in this simplistic way that Wally introduced us to and start thinking about it like Lynn Talley does. The ocean is a little bit more complex. It's not two layers, it's three. In the Atlantic, we have primarily two layers where we have this so here, and I'm gonna stick with these colors as much as possible um, through the rest of the talk, where we have surface water sinking, forming North Atlantic deep water is green. It crosses into the Southern Ocean and that gets colder and saltier or colder and fresher, but it gets it gets more dense and it forms Antarctic bottom water represented here in blue. And, um, and that water in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, here's the thing, in the Pacific and in Indian Oceans, they travel back north as Antarctic bottom water, but there's no northern outcropping. There's no northern deep water formation zone in either of these oceans. So that water travels back at mid depths by and, and mixes with Antarctic bottom water through isopycnal mixing gets a little bit less dense, picks up more CO2 because it hasn't degassed in the north, and it's not, it's not being made from surface water. Okay, so 
We have a three layer ocean in the Pacific and Indian Ocean where we have Antarctic intermediate water going north, Antarctic bottom water going north, and the deep waters coming back in the middle. Um, and the other thing we need to think about in order to understand changes in circulation and CO2 partitioning is the special circumstance of Drake's Passage. So at the latitude of Drake's Passage, there is no land all the way around the planet. It is a circumglobal, circumpolar ocean. And so, and it's a, it's a geost it's geostrophic flow, it's wind driven. And so what that means is any water coming south, like coming south in the Atlantic today, in order for it to cross the Antarctic circumpolar current or the ACC, there has to be some sort of um, pressure gradient by which that usually means land. Otherwise you can't have net meridional flow. To put that more uh, in a, a simpler way, uh, to help you visualize it, anything that has a, a, a something to push against, so shallower than the sill depth of Drake Passage, North Atlantic deep water can enter the Southern Ocean. Above that, it can't. So because that is your the, the, the sill of the, Drake's Passage still provides a place, the provides a place against which I like to think of it. The North Atlantic deep water can hide below that and sneak into the Southern Ocean. So if we look at that kind of graphically, I, I prefer graphs to math in my explanations. So today we have the ACC. That's our main flow coming through uh, uh, and going around the planet. Now, lower than that sill depth, North Atlantic deep water can sneak into the Southern Ocean. Okay, and then it's now it's down in, in, in the South Atlantic, it's in the Waddell Sea, it can, it can get more dense, it does get more dense and it forms Antarctic bottom water. It also, now that it's south of the ACC, it can travel around at those shallower depths and feed the basins all the way around the Southern Ocean and form be the main basis for Antarctic bottom water in the entire um, Southern Ocean today. But um, shallower than that, any water shallower than that has to get swept away into the ACC. And it really depends on where these fronts are, whether those that water is going to get from one basin to another. But that's another story. So if we look at that today in plan view, we have our ACC running around the Southern Ocean and we have deep water forming in the Raw Sea, the Waddell Sea, and uh, off of the Delhi coast here. And so our, and our North Atlantic deep water gets into that ocean and feeds it and makes a continuous, um, it's, a, it's a, a, a homogenous ocean today. Even though we have zonal formation of Antarctic bottom water, the primary waters feeding that are lower circumpolar deep water, which is functionally North Atlantic deep water. And today, that upper leather of upper circumpolar deep water, which is going around the Southern Ocean, is primarily fed by Pacific deep water and Indian Ocean deep water. And that's really important too, because um, those, um, because those waters, like I said, they don't have they don't have any connection with the atmosphere. They haven't been connected to the atmosphere and since they went north as Antarctic bottom water with a signal. So these waters are nutrient and CO2 rich. And so when they come to the surface and degas, as I showed in the last picture, they return the CO2 to the atmosphere um, before they sink again as these shallow water masses. So it's both circulation and winds that give us this balance between where the CO2 is today, uh, where the CO2 is today, atmosphere or ocean. Now one of, I'm now gonna step change and go back to paleo-oceanography and uh, show you this figure. So this is one of the most influential papers of the decade. Bill Curry and Dalia Appa went out and they took a bunch of cores. If you look really closely, you can actually see the little dots for all these cores. And they used C13 as a tracer for respired CO2, like I talked about before, that biopump concept. And they reconstructed the glacial uh, Western Atlantic Ocean. And today the C13 in the Atlantic Ocean is very enriched. It's very, uh, it would be in this picture, very red and very deep. And what they showed was that the, where North Atlantic deep water sits at about 2000 or below 2500 meters today, primarily it was sitting at about 1500 meters in the last glacial maximum. So basically North Atlantic deep water became North Atlantic intermediate water and we often call it glacial North Atlantic intermediate water. Um, so what does that mean for the rest of the ocean? 
because I've just said that there's Drake Passage. So if you don't have deep water, like we have today, where this NADW can sneak under Drake's Passage, enter the Southern Ocean and be a conduit or a, a, a um, uh, the, the base for uh, North Atlantic deep water, for Antarctic bottom water, then what, you know, what was happening back then. So any NADW or any GNIIW coming down the Atlantic has to have been swept away in the um, current, in the ACC, which means what was forming North Atlantic, uh, Antarctic bottom water in the other basins. So it can't have been the source of AEB double in other, uh, other basins. And so there was a great modeling study a few years ago where um, Ferrari et al showed that one of the other things we know happened in the Southern Ocean was this expansion of ice in the last glaciation. And so if you do that, if you expand ice and you move this, the location of this deep water exchange further north, you're going to shallow your, uh, your, um, your overturning circulation. And this is a really good model for the, for the, uh, for the, for the Atlantic because, um, whoops, where's my, there it is. So it's a really good model thing because you have this outcrop, you have the north, the water moves north at the surface and then moves south at the bottom. But the thing is, is this is a really good model for the Pacific, uh, for the Atlantic, but not for the Pacific because we do not have major intermediate water formation going on in the Pacific today, nor did we have in the past as much evidence for that. So we do not have intermediate water moving south in the uh, Pacific Ocean, it's moving north. So what this means to me is that that southerly flow, Pacific deep water and Indian Ocean deep water, but primarily Pacific deep water, has to have fed both arms of the circulation in the Pacific. So we don't have any ADW, that would have been green. So instead we have our Pacific deep water forming both Antarctic bottom water and intermediate water. And the important thing there is the sea ice expansion. So this water that's forming the intermediate water is not communicating with the atmosphere. And so we can hold a lot more CO2 simply by having Pacific deep water doing a double loop before it comes back and never getting to the, the uh, shallow Atlantic at all. And so I'm gonna show you the evidence for, I gave you my punchline first, now I'm gonna show you the evidence. So what we did was we did a profile of cores in the, in the Pacific Ocean, just off of New Zealand. Here's the, the cores and we've just got the DI, so the C13 on top of that, you can see enriched at the surface, this bolus of a depleted Pacific deep water coming south. And if I do a profile there, cause I'm gonna do some profiles uh, to show you how this works, you can see that, yep, mode water and Antarctic intermediate water are largely in, um, uh, equilibrium with the atmosphere and you're seeing this deep water with this deep respired signal in there. And so what we did was we took those cores, we did the C13 on them and we contoured them up. And here's what we saw. This is a paper from a couple of years ago. And so what you can see the red, so on the left is the, uh, is the modern and you can see that deep, the deep profile of the red intermediate and mode water being quite ventilated. And if you go over to the right where we are in the LGM, you can see the um, you can see that the, that the, the boundary between surface and deep water was much lower back then, and you can see that um, there's a big bolus of very C13 uh, depleted um, water below that. And so if we just because one of the things we're about is not just was there more CO2, but what were the triggers? So you can see whoops went the wrong way. That's the glaciation and there is the Heinrich right there where um, we uh, see warming in the Southern hemisphere. We see this pulse of ventilation down to depths almost like today. And then after that pulse, it's almost like that kick started it, kick started things. And then we see this deepening and flushing out of CO2 from the deep ocean. But I just wanna say, uh, but um, so that's for me was real evidence that A, we had, um, uh, lots of CO2 in the deep ocean. We have a trigger that's the winds in the Southern hemisphere pulsing that out. That would be the time when there was no, um, there was a slowdown of AMOC from the, the Northern hemisphere. But one of the things I always have to remember um, in, in being a fan of isotopes and a fan of C13 as a tracer is C13 can also be influenced by changes in nutrient content. 
And so another tracer that we've been working, I've been working with Kat Allen on is the boron calcium ratio in benthic foraminifera, because that is, um, that can tell us the carbonate ion content rather than just the respired content, which may be influenced by changes in nutrient utilization. So I'm just gonna put a line on these. Up on the left is cat recontoured our, that figure I just showed you in much less rainbow colors. And this on the lower right is the, um, is the carbonate ion and what you can see. And so that line just tells you these are the, we didn't do as many cores. And so this core here is the same as that core there. And what you can see is, Confir confirmation from the boron calcium that there was more CO, there was a lower carbonate ion content, which means a, a higher percentage of CO2 in the deep ocean. And we see also in that record about the same timing coming, releasing that CO2 from those Pacific deep water depth uh, locales. And one of the things I like the best about this is you can see that pulse here of, 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 uh, um, ventilated water coming down and then bouncing back that we see in the CO2 record. So, so the Pacific Ocean, it seems to be beating to its own drum and that became pretty um, uh, obvious to us. We decided, okay, we've been working in the Southern Ocean uh, in the, over here uh, in New Zealand. And if this deep water isn't coming into the ocean, what does that mean for not just the Pacific, but for the Atlantic. So we, we, work, we got to work with David Lund. He had a depth transect of cores here off of Brazil in that circle and we combined them. So first thing we did was we, um, we contoured up what he had in the same way we had. And what you can see is again on the left is, is Holocene and you can see that deep red, um, deep intermediate layer with that's very well ventilated. And then that bolus of CO2 uh, depleted and C13 enriched um, water coming out of the ocean. And so if we look at this through time, you can see there's your shallow North Atlantic intermediate water coming out in the glaciation. Then there's this kind of green gap in front of it, which is when um, we had that slowdown during Heinrich I of the meridional overturning circulation before it kickstarted again and blew the CO2. It sank and it blew the CO2 out of the ocean. So to look at this quantitatively, we tried a lot of ways of looking at this. And in the end, we went back to this because um, this is how you can compare the two oceans. So this is the modern C13 on the left of the oceans today. And you can see that bolus of C13 um, enriched CO2, uh, or CO2 poor water in the Atlantic. Those are the triangles and more CO2 and more depletion in the Pacific in the circles. And I just am going to show you, I've also got here the Delo 18 because today they look pretty similar because basically North Atlantic deep water is homogenizing the ocean. And you're going to see that that was also different in the past. So if I show you the comparison between, ah, yes, and at the surface, there's our intermediate water, which has also been, um, uh, and mode water, which is communicated with the ocean and has low uh, enriched C13 because it doesn't have much CO2. So if we look at our glacial um, ocean, um, and for all of these going forward, the solid line and the triangles is the Pacific and the open circles and the dotted line is the Atlantic. So the first thing you can see here, this is a just, we binned our cores and we, um, so that we could, uh, for a, a time slice, and so we could look at these different time slices to try and figure out the triggers. And so here you have our bolus of CO2 uh, poor, C13 rich um, water coming out of the Atlantic, and it's at about 15, 1800 meters, not at 3000. So there you go. The other thing I want you to look at as you go through this is the deep oceans are quite different. So the, the Pacific has a lot more CO2 in it than the deep Atlantic. And so if we go through the Heinrich one, what's interesting here is we, what, we see what we expected. We see that the C13 is a little bit less um, because we're not having as much water coming out of the um, uh, Atlantic. But what surprised us was that what's going on in the Pacific. The Pacific, the deep Pacific is ventilating. In fact, the whole Pacific is ventilating when there's nothing changing in the deep Atlantic. And if we go from there to the Antarctic cold reversal, it's the same thing. We, we see the Pacific charging forward and the Atlantic kind of like not doing anything in the deep 
or in the shallow, but particularly in the deep. And then there's our younger Dryas. We're starting to see things that look a little bit like uh, modern, where the deep water, the North Atlantic intermediate water is becoming deep water. And then there's our Holocene. So what we suggest is that in the um, Pacific Ocean, by looking at it against the Atlantic, we can say that we had sea ice step back in Heinrich. We started to ventilate our shallow water masses, but we also started to shallow, ventilate our surface water masses. The wind's blowing in the sweet spot and we're getting more upwelling. Um, that was shown by Bob Anderson in his classic paper in 2009. But we also think that there must have been some meltwater input, which meant that we had a pulse of ventilation um, in the um, Heinrich where we saw that deepening, but then the meltwater took over and kind of meant that only the mode water was ventilated until much later in the process. Okay, so let's look now, I've said, C13 is, um, has, uh, can be influenced by changes in nutrients, but DELO18, Cesare, God bless him, is a conservative tracer for water masses. So let's look at this, same thing, you're gonna see two things different, but first of all, the Atlantic and the Indian Pacific were pretty similar in the LGM. And then that first Heinrich one, what you're seeing is that blue line, you're seeing shallow, a little bit of shallow water, but a little bit of a meltwater pulse coming out of the North Atlantic. As you lean over in the, those surface waters, you're seeing a depleted meltwater source, source from the Northern Hemisphere. And it's really quite extreme in the Antarctic which is the bowling of the road. But Again, look at this, nothing's going on in the deep, deep Atlantic. It's all, but the deep Pacific is charging ahead. And it's not until after the Younger Dryas that we see the two catch up like they are today. So if we have um, no influence of Antarctic bottom water, uh, sorry, North Atlantic deep water in the um, coming out of the Atlantic Ocean in the glaciation, um, what's filling it? And so I just want to highlight, there was a study just came out like a month ago uh, in Nature Geosciences by you et al. And what they showed with their neodymium tracer, which is also a conservative tracer for north versus uh, southern sourced waters. I'm not going to go into the techniques, but they were able to show that during the glaciation, there was a, there was a, a lot of a Pacific signal in the deep Atlantic. So there must have been some Pacific deep water coming through uh, Drake Passage to fill in for the Antarctic bottom, thus for the North Atlantic water that couldn't be there. And I just wanna finish up with one last concept here. So what we did was we were looking at these, we were looking at these different layers uh, in, in a time series. And I'll, I've now finally showing you why I haven't shown you the raw data. This is what it looks like. And so differentiating these signals between the different water masses through time is, is problematic, but we have a shallow core in both locations that was basically in equilibrium with the atmosphere. And so that's that red line here. And so our shallow core, and these are all benthic records, so we're not worrying about benthic planktonic you know, differences. So what we did was we subtracted each of the deeper cores from that signal in the shallower core to take out the global change and look at the relative changes in those different depths. And so this was from Clementi and Sykes, which came out last year. There's two things I wanna draw your eye to. This is our Pacific record. So right here is when CO2 started up about 18,000 years ago, 17.5, we can argue about that too. But what we see in the deep Pacific is it started to degas about 20,000 years ago or maybe earlier, that's where our record stops. But then we have this pulse in Heinrich one where we know that there was um, increased winds and such in the Southern Ocean. So, and so we have this early burn from the deep ocean and a, a pulse from the shallows. All of this happened before AMOC influenced the Pacific, right? So I've just showed you with my DELO 18, the Pacific was not communicating with the Atlantic um, prior to this. So now I can put on here the work we're still working on. Some of it's from Clementi and Sykes and some of it's still in prep. But again, I've got my Atlantic in a dotted line and my Pacific in a solid line. Two things to take home from this very complicated record. This is um, this here, the blue is sort of what you've seen before. We broke it down into different water masses, but you're seeing this slow burn out of the Pacific starting at the two, so bottom water, Antarctic bottom water depths and lower circumpolar deep water depths. But 
the Pacific, so the Atlantic, not, uh, not at all. Right here, there's our upper circumpolar deep waters. It's going the wrong way until halfway through the Heinrich. And the same thing in the um, North Atlantic deep water decks, the lower circumpolar deep water decks. It's going the wrong way until halfway through the Heinrich. So it's coming out of the Atlantic and we are seeing an, an increase here starting in the Heinrich, but where did all of this go? And there was a wonderful modeling study by Lori Venvial and her group. And so I've tried to list everyone here. What they were able to show with their model is if you move the fronts down, you get the winds just exactly where they are. You start degassing, but you also start shifting all of that CO2 that's been sitting in the deep Pacific over to the deep Atlantic. So where did that CO2 go that wasn't that was coming out of the Pacific before the CO2 in the atmosphere went up? It probably went into the Atlantic and then it came out in a pulse. And this is all before without any influence of deep water from the northern hemisphere. And I just want to point out here, there were two studies using neodymium, which is a like just like the U paper, another tracer for north versus southern sources that show stirrings of ventilation in the deep northern and southern Pacific well before we see anything in the Atlantic. So I think this is fairly strong evidence that the Southern Ocean is driving this initial deglaciation through the physics that are going on there. And I'm gonna, um, one last little teaser. Uh, we've just started working in the Indian Ocean. I've got two cores, I've got one core, we've got a lot of data, and then another core, we've got a bit of a teaser. And these are both the subjects of talks later in the uh, week here at AGU um, by my student and our postdoc. So I just wanna give you a teaser here. So from the deep core, um, which is 3,100 meters. I just wanna run through very quickly. What you're seeing here is all the stuff I've been showing you. So that's our CO2 and our temperature record. In this core, we have manganese, which uh, uh, manganese, mobile manganese shows that we're, we're getting more oxygen. And so that green line right below, uh, second, second graph down is our manganese from our core and it's leading the upwelling from that classic uh, uh, important paper by uh, Bob Anderson et al. from 2009. Our neodymium in this core is showing that um, despite this early ventilation or early oxygenation, we're not seeing North Atlantic deep water until maybe the ACR, but certainly no significant influence until afterwards. And, in, and yet here is my, our, here are our benthic C13 for that core. It shows a big pulse, a step back, but this also occurred before a meridional overturning um, um, in the Atlantic kicked back in. This is our signal for no, no wa uh, water coming out of the Atlantic in the Heinrich. And then this is sortable silt. So you can see that despite the fact, so the coarser the, the silt, the higher the currents. And so we had low currents in the LGM and that persisted until the Younger Dryas. So what we wanted to do, what we want to do in the uh, um, Indian Ocean is what we were doing in the Pacific, which is compare uh, a shallow core to a deep core. So we've just got in our C13 from um, our shallow core, core 50, that's 1100 meters. And I'm gonna show you that next, but I just wanna to remember to say, see, if you want to understand this data, go see Tom Williams' talk, uh, PPO, 1504 on December 9th. And this paper is in review in QSR. So you can see it in print, we hope very soon. So if we just do the same subtraction I was, we were doing with the Comente and Sykes work in 2018, this is the rough record that I, we've just got literally hot off the press. And what we can see is the difference between our 1100 meter core and our 3100 meter core in the LGM and leading into it is quite extreme. And then there's this huge step change right during the Heinrich, right at the time of upwelling from Bob Anderson's work in uh, 2009. So um, to sum up, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna leave you with somebody else's work. These are, and I'll just quickly run you through it so you can look at it, but this is, this is ice core CO2, atmospheric C14. And I haven't shown you this. This is the temperature record from Antarctica. And this is a sea salt sodium record, which is a proxy for sea ice in the Southern Ocean. This is an Antarctic core. And so here's our LGM about 20,000 years ago. I've drawn a red line on there. That's where we see the temperature start to go up in the mid latitudes. 
And we can see that from that orange record, the temperature in Antarctica didn't go up, but we know that the lower latitudes did. And look at that line of the sea of the of the proxy for ice. We're seeing the ice start to decrease starting at about 20,000 years ago. So that I think sums up to evidence to believe that the Southern Ocean it's warming, early warming and ventilation led the, we know that it led the increase in AMOC. And so that gives me the idea or gives me this hypothesis that the physical process in the Southern Ocean may have been driving this chain. It was the engine, not the caboose. I'm happy to take questions. Do we have questions out there? You can put them in the chat or you can put them um, in the questions and answers, I guess. Um, I am not, I'm not seeing any questions. I do, while we're waiting for someone to think of a question, I can make a, I can make a comment. Um, yes, in the middle, in the beginning of my talk, I did get a text message. I had forgotten to mute my phone, so I had to answer it, otherwise it would have continued to bleat for the next 30 minutes. And believe it or not, it was a dear friend of mine congratulating me on getting the Emiliani Prize, or lecture prize. And I think it's nice to have um, that preserved in the talk as well. <laughs> so. And uh, I, I guess, and again, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'll continue to comment, seeing as I'm very good at that, and say that I, I did mention uh, Tom Williams' talk, but I also want to say Ryan Glaubke is giving his talk tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time, if you wish to uh, join in. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. John Dunning, how does the degassing process mean that does the degassing process mean that there is a limit to how acidic the oceans can get? Um, no, I don't, I don't think there's a limit. I mean, if you really put more CO2 into the deep ocean, it's, it, oh God, I don't know the answer to that uh, numerically. Certainly um, there has to be a limit to uh, how these processes interact, but I think the ocean can hold uh, well, it certainly holds a lot more CO2 now than it did in the past, or it did in the last glaciation. I'm going to um, pass I, on that one. I'm not sure. <laughs> Janine Marie Saint Jacques, um, what drives the Southern Ocean changes at 20,000 years ago? I think we've been looking into that lately, and that we didn't fit into the talk. But if you look at the orbital cycles, so I, I gave you that teaser with the sea salt and talking about the temperatures. Those temperatures, those mid-latitude temperatures change starting at 20, 21,000, depending on what record you're looking at from where. And so I would say I think it's a mid-latitude thing. That's why I lean so heavily on Bob Anderson's paper from 2009 where he shows this upwelling signal. I think when the winds get to a sweet spot, um, that's important. But I think really, oh, and so it's, it's, it, warming at the mid-latitudes, and if you look at the orbital um, insulation for mid-latitudes, um, their maximum is about 20,000 years. So I think it's actually primary forcing, so they're sort of getting some sort of southern hemisphere push, and then I think all these other feedbacks had it, add in. Okay, Sarah Green, where would, the, be the, where would the next place be to core, and what would be learned there? I'm giving you a shift, um, go core. Going. Well, having just come back from the uh, Indian Ocean, I would really like to go back and core uh, east of Australia and up into the uh, Tasman Sea. Although that's a dead end sea in a sense for uh, deep waters, because it's got a sill at the north end that's about 1,500 meters, I'd like to look at the intermediate waters that are coming up that basin because we really don't have a good idea. And that would help us look at these differences between the Indian and Pacific. The Pacific's so huge. Where are you going to get, and it's so deep, where are you going to get mud? And I'd like to go back to the, to the Tasman Sea and go again, do it again. <laughs> so Chris Hayes has, um, was there ever any deep water formation in the North Pacific? 
Okay, I really very much stick to the late quaternary, and so I can't speak about any further back than that, but pretty much no. I mean, for the last several glacial cycles, there's no evidence for intermediate water formation or deep water formation, significant deep water formation in the North Pacific. Okay, here's a good one. Um, is there a significant role of iron in the time frame that you're talking about? Ah, good question. We are, we've just put a proposal in to try and look at that nutrient, um, nutrient utilization question. And so I'm going to say, no, I don't have an answer now, but with a little bit of luck, we will have an answer for you in a few years. Um, okay, so James Acker has, can you highlight any substantive differences in an event timing you have found from um, Shekin 2012? Um, no, I, I don't know. I think that the reason I cite that or I talk about that paper is I think the data in that has held very, very well. And with the newer uh, CO2 records, we can really see that the finer records, we can really see that um, pulse of ventilation that we have in Heinrich 1, which is actually halfway through Heinrich 1, coincides with a huge pulse of CO2, uh, a minor but but significant pulse in CO2. So I think we really, um, uh, you can really blame the Southern Ocean, winds in the Southern Ocean for that little spike. I think I'll stick with that. Okay. Um, Karen Cofield asks, at what point do you hypothesize that the disconnect between the Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific began in the glacial cycle? Ah, that's why you should go see uh, Tom Williams' talk. He hypothesizes in this work, he, he looked at a full glacial cycle all the way back to um, stage five deer. We didn't quite get stage six. And he thinks it happened quite early on in stages, I'm gonna forget, but it's stage five C, B, C, D, somewhere in there, but really right at the very beginning. He thinks that there was a disconnect starting very early. And I see in the chat, I misspoke. Ryan's talk is Friday at seven. So. Uh, for Rachel Spratt, can you comment on the sphere drop strength of AMOC following the Southern Ocean's kickstart at or after 18,000 years? Okay, so what we've got is those couple of records of sortable silt. Um, I didn't show the sortable silt from the um, shallow core, but we can see that we, we saw a change in the ventilation several thousand years before we see an increase in the strength. So I think it was like I when I call it a slow burn, I think it was a slow burn. So what we're seeing is a change in how much uh, ventilation, how much exchange with the atmosphere without seeing a change in speed till quite a lot later. Okay. Um, that's about um, all I can tell I'm you. Not, I don't know about the spare drops, but the strength, I can give you a relative strength. Go ahead, uh, Ingrid. Sorry. Ellen Martin asks, does this imply the changes in Southern Ocean trigger the changes in AMOC in the North Atlantic? Um, good question. I'm I'm going to say I'm a little bit I I think so. I think that that um, if you're pumping you know Antarctic intermediate water there, it, it could be. I'm going to bail on that one. I'm not exact. I there isn't there isn't a lot of evidence um, for the, the waters from the Southern Ocean pushing it, but if you change the volumes, that might actually change. There is a good modeling study from a few years ago that suggests that you can, yes, I'm gonna, uh, uh, it's um, from 2014, where it's the volume of the intermediate water. If you keep building up, if you make the intermediate water thicker and thicker and thicker, you can sort of trigger the North Atlantic deep water to come back on. So yes, based on that study, not on my work, um, I would um, say yes, that you can. Okay, Beth Cassie asks, there are a couple of papers looking at deep Pacific, Pacific deep water forming in the North Pacific during the LGM. Would this water be a source of Pacific water in what you call the double loop that leads to Antarctic bottom water? Or do you think it's more locally formed Pacific deep water that the double, in that double loop and the North Pacific stays relatively unconnected like today? Um, I think, I think it stays relatively unconnected. I don't think there's a really, a lot of strong evidence for well ventilated, um, Pacific deep water forming or Pacific deep water forming de novo 
um, in, in glacial times. Okay, we're getting a time to wrap up. So one more question. Um, okay, so um, from Murat Aiden, a question on the focus of Heinrich I as the beginning of ventilation. Is this argument based primarily on the timing of events or do you see a clear mechanism between ice discharge in the North Atlantic and what's going on in the South? So well, this, this interpretation yeah, this interpretation is based on what we're seeing in the Southern Ocean. Um, and and because um, most of the Heinrich stuff, that, most of the Heinrich uh, events, the things that is, we see associated with the Heinrich are um, 1,500 years into the Heinrich event to the point where we've, we've started slicing the Heinrich event in half. And so I don't, I can't, I, I'm going to be very, very careful here and say, I don't know if it's um, uh, related to the meltwater in the in the North Atlantic, but uh, the uh, certainly we're seeing a different timing in the Southern Hemisphere and in the Southern Oceans that we've been looking at comes about halfway through. Um, and I I, I, okay. I don't know when they're going to cut us off, but I'm just going to say thank you everyone for coming in this time of COVID, taking your time to uh, to be here. It's been a real honor. And I want to thank the committee and the nominators and the section for, for this honor. Well, thank you, Liz, for uh, giving a great talk. Um, and I don't know when we're going to get cut off either. 